We made a very good series. I, I'm not bragging. I, I'm telling you after the fact that everybody put their heart and soul into it and worked together, and we succeeded in making a series that I'm so proud of. Let's go 38 to 47, just that far. We had uh, Andrea Romano as our recording director, and, uh, and she also cast the show. The real secret of the show was the casting. Andrea studied acting uh, in college uh, in New York, and then she became a stage manager, I think, and then she became an agent, and then she eventually became a director of animation. But so she understands what actors go through. She understands the process. So the recording sessions were always really wonderful, wonderful experience that everyone would look forward to. We, you know, had a meeting with her and kind of told her, you know, the, the kind of overall feel that we wanted the show to have, that it would be, you know, very much, you know, realistic and straight um, and serious and uh, not not high pitched and, and super high energy, you know, like, like say, Tiny Tunes. I think we even mentioned that we said, yeah, it, 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 ideally it would sound like a movie from the 1940s, you know, that kind of fast paced, but realistic, you know, kind of naturalistic. And she seemed to get it immediately. She goes, she goes I know exactly what you want. For a show like Batman, I need killer actors, ideally actors with stage credits, because it's that energy that's needed. I had never done an animated voice before. I had never auditioned for an animated voice before. I was a stage actor. I went to Juilliard. I worked on Broadway, I worked off Broadway, I worked for Joe Papp at the public. I was a New York actor. For the single character of Batman itself, I know I listened to well over 500 voices, well over. So many actors. We didn't fall in love with anybody. And when you're casting something as awesome as Batman for a series called Batman, you want to fall in love with them. You really want to fall in love with them. I had done commercial voiceovers in New York, so I had a voiceover agent. And he said, they're putting together a new show over at Warner Brothers. Uh, I know you haven't done any animation, but why don't you go over and give it a shot? It's Batman. And I said, no. I said, Batman's been around forever. It was on when I was a kid. I didn't go with any preconceptions. I didn't go with any preconceived notions or anticipation of who I was going to meet. I didn't know who Bruce Tim was. I didn't know who Andrea Romano was. I was just an actor going into an audition. So we bring him in on the callbacks, and he walks through the door, and he asked a couple of very intelligent questions. And then we let him audition for the voice of Batman. And it was truly the eureka moment that you wish for. Bruce and I looked at each other and just, you could see the stress of months of auditions just fall from our faces because we had found Batman. It was remarkable. The trick over this long arc has been to not let it get stale. And I learned this early on, Batman is not the disguise. Batman is who he went to, is what, be, what he became because of the tragedy of his childhood. It's where he found safety. It's where he is most comfortable, in that cave. And the suit of armor he puts on, the role he plays for the world, is Bruce Wayne. That's the performance. And so once I found that about the character, it really made sense to me. It kept the Batman voice from sounding artificial, and it kept Bruce Wayne from, it, it made him such a different persona. Kevin Conroy is just phenomenal, but it's not just him. I remember my agent called and left a message on my answering machine. And he's like, oh my God, you're her. You're the girl. You're the girl that's the bat. You're bat girl. And he was screaming and I was screaming and I was like, oh my God. Like it was just such a huge thrill to, to book it. I was excited about it, but it was really like, this is a really good job, a really nice job. And I hope it lasts, you know, that'd be nice to do a few episodes. You know, here we are talking about it 25 years later. We're still talking about that show. N had no idea had no idea that something like that was going to happen. Andrea Romano was able to, you know, she's amazing in terms of not only her ability to, to figure out who, who to put where, but to get to them and to convince them to do it. Every week there'd be some incredible guest star, and Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., and of course Arlene Sorkin. It was just 
an amazing, magical time. Who thinks of going to Paul Williams to be the penguin? It was perfect, and it just sounded like a weird place because they were pulling guys. Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. was a great idea. You know, the guy had a voice, but it's like he wasn't a voice actor up until that point, and neither was Mark Hamill. Actors all live, to a certain extent, in a fantasy world. And to me, doing Batman was a, a lifelong dream in the sense that I always thought that the character actors had the most fun. Oddly enough, as fate would have it, Tim Curry, who was voicing the Joker for me, was not a favorite of one of the new producers who came on the show. And truth be told, I never would have replaced Tim Curry. I loved Tim. I thought he was doing a beautiful job. But I could never please this producer. So now I have to find the Joker. But we're at least two or three, maybe four episodes into animation with Tim Curry's voice. So the animation is done, the mouth flaps exist, there's an energy, there's a performance, there's a timing that I have to find an actor who can bring their own joker to it and voice, uh, mouth flap, match, tune, and sing because the character say in the Christmas episode. So I auditioned, auditioned, auditioned people and I went, you know what, I've got to give Mark a shot at this. This might just be the answer to our prayers. Mark Hamill, oh my God, do you think we can get him? Mark walked in and he was incredible. One of the things it said at the top of the root of the audition script, don't think Nicholson. What a what a relief that was. Because I figured if you're going to just try and imitate Jack Nicholson, you're gonna really suffer. Because as wonderful he is in the movie, Jack is Jack. All we can do is imitate, and that's not something I wanted to do. I remember hearing his audition for the Joker. And it was the laugh. Once I heard the laugh, I was going like, oh, God, that's, that, that's it. <laughs> You're really sick, you know that, boss? Mm -hmm. It just sent goosebumps down my spine. He has so inhabited that role, and, and it would just sort of physically take over his body as he did it. It was, it was an amazing transformation to watch. If the world decides to build a Mount Rushmore for the Joker, it's going to be Jack Nicholson, Heath Ledger, and Mark Hamill. Because Mark is the definitive voice of the Joker. The Joker that you hear today on the cartoon by Mark Hamill is exactly the Joker he did for us when he walked in and auditioned for us. It was manic, it was funny, and there was a little element of tragedy to it. There was just a little bit of like, this, this guy is a lost soul and he doesn't care. And and that's what made it scary. It was as if from childhood he had thought about how he would voice the Joker, if he ever got the chance to do it. Everyone was doing these incredible villain characters. Arlene, wonderful as Harley, uh, I, I, I brought her up and said, hey, you know, I'm kind of basing this character on my friend. She's a comedic actress. How about getting her to do the voice? And Andrea was saying, like, well, OK, I'll give her a shot. And she came in, and she had this sort of warped Billie Holiday quality to her voice. And the fact that she hadn't done voiceover, that made her want to experiment and try different things. And, and uh, she brought in a newness to, to, uh, to her performance and to that character. And it really clicked. Harley Quinn's a great example. What a character created by uh, Paul Dini and Bruce Timm. And here she is, this, this sort of zany sidekick to uh, the Joker, that it, it came from Batman the Animated Series, and now they're, Warner Brothers is thinking of giving her own movie franchise. I mean, this thing really did create some uh, lasting uh, images and some lasting characters. So it was fun to have actors of that caliber, you know, and uh, we had like almost the entire crew um, lined up um, like, a, like a radio play. A great thing about recording for Warner Brothers um, and Andrea Romano specifically is they really like to get all the actors together in a room. I can't say that I insisted upon it, but I, I really tried to always make that happen on every series I directed because a major part of acting is reacting. So you have the other actors to bounce things off of. I wouldn't be nearly as good in what I do if I didn't have Mark Hamill feeding me as the Joker. So typically when there's a group cast record, 
All the actors will be in a semicircle facing this, the booth so that we can see the director. Everyone's in the room together, and it's just one big room. And you have music stands, and you've got a microphone, and you've got headsets on. So we would all be sitting there, all of us, except for Mark Hamill, who would always stand. I always knew Mark was in the show because I'd come in, and there'd be one microphone stand standing. I said, oh, Mark's in this episode. You're really listening to each other and playing off each other. It's a very collaborative world. I would say a line, and maybe the other actor would pause before saying something. And that would give me pause and make me think about what are they thinking. This is what you do in every realm of, of where, where good acting is involved. And that, that situation where we were all in the room together, that lent itself to that. I wanted to make sure that there was a sensitivity to these pieces, and that's why you'll see where there are emotional scenes that are played. I, I let them breathe. I wanted them to breathe. I wanted to take more time. I wanted the actors to make me cry, and it, they almost always did. And if they didn't, I felt like I hadn't done my job right. Andrea knew what to say to get the actors to give the performance that she and the other people in the booth we're expecting or envision. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'll describe the action that I think is important for you to know, and we'll just go scene by scene. So remember, the animation is done later. We do the voice first. And all we get is a script with words on it. When we record, it's up to Andrea to paint the pictures for us. And that's what she would do. She would really paint the pictures of what was going on, because she'd seen the storyboards. And she would tell us, you know, uh, okay, you're, you're in a helicopter and, and the mountain is coming right at you. And, you know, these kinds of things you, you, you couldn't necessarily picture or get from the script. There would be brief descriptions, but she would really paint the picture of it. And if it wasn't quite the right sound, you know, especially like, uh, you know, in the fights, you know, there are different kinds of fights. You know, there's a difference between an uh and an ooh. So she would say, okay, now you're getting kicked in the stomach. You know, Ugh! and she sees the storyboard. No, you're getting really kicked hard in the stomach. <laughs> so, you know, those are, you know, those are things that we would not be able to do unless we had, you know, a wonderful captain at the helm that she, you know, was and is. I would never ask an actor to do something that I wouldn't do. So I was right there with them. I would cry with them. I would angry with them. I would yell with them. I would do everything. I would do it first so that they could see that it's okay to to do it that broad. It's okay to, to you know, to cry, to yell, to be, you know, all those things. These are super real, authentic, emotional pieces that we were working on. And that's part of why the show was so well loved by the fans. They felt that authenticity.